All right, all right. Hello, everybody. Why don't you go ahead and stand? Uh, I just have a few things I like updating you guys on at the top of the service, and then we'll get to worshiping the Lord together. Um, first, I wanted to welcome you here to New Life Young Adults. If you are new here and I uh, haven't had a chance of meeting you, that's why as you came in the room, there's a table. We call that the welcome table, and you can head there after the service. Uh, I'll be there, but also Victoria Dudek, who's in the room. She's our young adult coordinator. She's back there. And uh, yeah, we, we're, we're wanting to meet anyone who's new, as well as if you have any questions, that's the place to go. So we'll see you there after the service is over um, if you have any questions or would like to meet. Um, then also, I want to let you guys know that we have an email list. And the reason this email list is so important, they're going to put on the screen how you can sign up. You can go to that link or just use a QR code. And uh, we scroll that after the service. The reason I have to always announce this is because we meet almost every Tuesday, but not every Tuesday. And the way you know which ones we're meeting and not is by being on that email list. We only send the schedule through it. It's a once a month email. And then you can also follow us on Instagram or on Facebook. And uh, we, we post the schedule there too. So that's why the email list is so important. <clears throat> also want to let you guys know at the end of this month, we already announced that the our women's ministry is having the HER conference on April 29th, and so we encourage you guys to sign up for that. It's going to be awesome. But on the same day, we have an opportunity to serve, and so this is going to be for the, all the guys in the room. Um, we have an opportunity to serve two of the schools here in the local area. And last week, I was talking about how um, serving is such an important part of your personal growth in Christ, and there are so many of us who we can't continue in this faith and growing in it if you never give to others. And so here's an invitation. Here's a way that you could do that. Again, we'll put this after the service scrolling through. And if you would be willing to give up a Saturday morning to serve two of the schools in our area, all you have to do is just sign up. And uh, we're going to have Benson leading that. He might be here by the end of the service. And if you have any questions, you can ask him about that again. At the welcome table, we'll be hanging out back there. So guys, if you're free on April 29th, please sign up. Give up a morning and serve some of the... Uh, community here where God has placed us. Finally, I want to let you know that we got Josh Dillon in the house. That's Josh over there. Josh waved to everyone. Josh, uh, Josh is going to be preaching tonight. He serves as our section community pastor here at New Life North. So if you guys attend New Life North, you know we sit in these big sections. And, and one of the ways that we make a big church small is by those uh, sections meeting and gathering so they can start building relationships. And so Josh oversees all that, and I invited him to join us here tonight. So he's going to be bringing a message as we continue in our series, Holiness and Humanity. So that's all I got. Let's, um, let me pray, and then after I pray, we will dive in and worship together. Father, thank you for meeting us here. Thank you that as we lean in, you don't wonder, we don't have to wonder if you're going to lean in. Your heart is always willing. You're not reluctant to meet us here. You're not reluctant to bless us. And so what we're saying right here at the top of this service, God, is we are here. We're, we want to be present to the ever-present God. We're inviting you to move and that we would become aware of what it is that you're doing here in this place. And so receive these songs that we sing. We sing every, receive everything that we bring because we bring it as worship to you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said... Amen. Come on, let's worship the Lord.
we just sang in that bridge, that rain came and wind blew, uh, come from the tail end of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, where he gives us the Beatitudes, he gives us, like, be a peacemaker, be merciful, uh, hunger and thirst for righteousness, right? Um, and he, he says, a- after that, he says, a person that hears my words and does them is a wise man who's built his house upon the rock. And then when we look in Isaiah, or in a lot of places in the Bible, actually, we're told to trust in the Lord forever, because in God, we have an everlasting God. And so I think the invitation might be uh, to entrust ourselves to Jesus, to not be leaning on our own understanding, to not be leaning on our own interpretation of a situation or the environment we're in, uh, but to instead to hold it open-handed and say, uh, Jesus, what do, you, what do you think? Jesus, make me a little more like you. Make me respond with grace to this person like you would. Make me seek to forgive because they don't know what they're doing. May I be more and more and more and more like you. And so I just want to invite us as we sing this next song, uh, this next song talks about more of you, less of me, take everything and just begin to, as we sing it, sing it as a prayer. Sing it, sing it with all of your heart and just reflect like, all right, God, what is it going to cost me? What is it going to take? Is it going to take a, a trust in, in uh, the Lord for some reason, <laughs> a trust in your finances? a trust over school, a trust over relationships, friendships, whatever that might be, just hold it open-handed and say more of you, less of me, more of you, less of me.
just want to take a moment right here because it's a song we've sung, but I want to make sure we all understand what we're asking God to do. Because if we're not careful, there could be something that you think we're saying that we're not saying. And that is this, when we say, God, make me more like Jesus, the emphasis of that is that we're asking God to do it. Because the idea of I have to become more like Jesus is daunting and it just feels like we're saying we're just going to try harder and that's the answer to the Christian life. So I just want to make sure everyone understands that the beautiful thing that we're asking God here is, Father, would you do it? It's the invitation. All we're doing is surrender. All we're doing is, God, here I lay it down. If more of you means less of me, then take everything. Like it's, it's the idea of surrender. But it's so important for those of us who, who feel the, you know, the dissonance between the life I'm living and the life I want to live for God. And we all have that. We're not just doing perfect at everything. No one here in this room is just crushing it in every way as a Christian. We all have this gap between who we know God's called us to be and who we currently are. So the beauty of this moment is not so that you leave services like these and songs like these and think, I'm just gonna do better. The beauty of this moment is you saying, I can't do better, but I will surrender to a God who has the power to change. So just, it's just really important to me as a pastor that anytime we, we sing this song, that you hear in your mind, yes, I want to be more like Jesus, but that's not on you. <laughs> that's not something you do by yourself. That's something we ask God to do. Father, I pray, make me more like Jesus, because only God can do that. So if you feel like you walked in here tonight with a bit of a, it's on me, I want you to release that right now, just in your heart. And let this moment be the place where you say, God, I can't. And that's worship for God. He hears it. When, if you can get to the I can't, now you're getting ready for the what God does. But so many times what's in the way of God doing is that we still think we can. So just right there where you are, just close your eyes for a second. And just, just get in the presence of God. And let's all get to that place of surrender. Whatever you think you have to just muster up more energy for, whatever you just need to try harder for, would you just release that right here, right now? It's not about our doing, it's about what God's done. And anything that changes from here and that where we do become in the likeness of Christ is because we have surrendered and only through the power of the Holy Spirit does change happen. Sing that bridge again.
acquainted with our grief, the man of sorrow, son of suffering, blood and tears, how can it be, there's a God who weeps, there's a God who Your stripes, my healing, all praise, King Jesus, glory to God, your blood still speaking, your love still reaching, all praise, King Jesus, glory to God forever, your cross.
There's a God who bleeds. Oh, praise the one who would reach for me. Hallelujah to the Son of Suffering. Sing it again. Hallelujah to the Son of Suffering. Hallelujah to the Son. Thank you so much for being here with us at Young Adults. It's wonderful to see you. Uh, Pastor Josh is about to preach to you. He sent me like a three-sentence uh, summary of what it's going to be, and you're going to really like it, I'm here to tell you. Uh, so go ahead and turn to somebody, give him a high five, hug, handshake, uh, and just have a seat, and we'll get started soon. Feel the love in the room tonight. So good. I love that you guys love each other. I love that you're friends. Man, what uh, an honor it is. What a joy it is to get to share this space with you guys. Like Pastor Eddie said, my name is Josh. Uh, I'm the section community pastor here at North. Basically, long story short, all that means is that I get to spend my time helping people build meaningful uh, relationships and engagement with each other. I think you guys have something like that going on. Raise your hand if you're part of a crew. If you guys do that. Okay, a couple of us. All right. <laughs> Got some room for community. I love it. Anyways, we need people to follow Jesus. And I love getting to serve uh, in that way. 
Um, I'm really eager to open up the word with you guys tonight. But before we do that, I just kind of want to get a sense for who I'm talking to a little bit. So, okay, you guys are in the young adult season, which is like 18, 20, somewhere in there. Um, how many of you guys are, would claim the moniker Coloradans? How many of you are Coloradans in the room? Did you, you grew up here, more or less. Okay. How many of you guys are from out of state? All right, who thinks they're from the farthest place? Just shout, shout one out if you think you're from the farthest. I think she wins. <laughs> I think she wins. Man. Well, I am a Coloradan, more or less. I grew up here, um, right here in New Life. You guys, God is doing good things, um, and it's a joy to get to be with you. If you've got your Bibles, go ahead and pull them out. Go to Mark chapter 12. We're going to be in verses 28 through 34. I'll give you guys a second to get there. We'll pray. We'll talk. We're going to get into the Word. Uh, I'm going to give you guys a couple takeaways, and then we'll go from there. But let's, let's pray. Let's welcome Jesus into this space. Yeah, Lord. Yeah, we come before you. We come before you, God, hungry to know you, Jesus. Hungry to know you, Jesus. Lord, hungry for the real thing. Lord, hungry for a faith that actually works. Hungry for a Jesus that's actually real and present in our lives. God, we look to you. God, we look to you like the psalmist says, Lord, like the hand of a servant to his master. We look to you, we're waiting. God, I know, even in, in James says that, that all good things, good gifts come from you. So God, we're here and we're ready. Our hands are open tonight to receive the good that you have for us. Lord, so may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. We love you, Jesus. And all of God's people said... Amen and amen. Let's go ahead and read the word together. This is Mark 12, 28 through 34. This is what it says. Then one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, this hymn is Jesus, says, which is the first commandment of all? Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God <clears throat> with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second like it is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There's no other commandment greater than these. So the scribe said to him, well said, teacher, you've spoken the truth. For there is one God, and there is no other but he. And to love him with all of the heart, with all the understanding, with all the soul, and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself, is more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Now, when Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. But after that, no one dared question him. This is the word of the Lord. All God's people said, thanks be to God. All right. You guys have been in holiness and humanity lately, right? Talking about how the holiness of Jesus, what it looks like when he comes down and meets us in our lives. Tonight, I want to introduce you guys to a character, an individual that Jesus interacts with, and kind of a larger population. Now, this story zooms in on a man called the scribe. But to understand the scribe, you've got to understand the people that he runs with, his friends, his, his crew, if you will. Now, you guys know these people. They kind of get a bad rap throughout the Gospels. But this guy was a part of a group called the Pharisees, the religious leaders. Now, I know you guys have even talked about the Pharisees in this series before. But long story short, right, the Pharisees are some of Jesus' greatest adversaries. They're the religious leaders who, when they get confronted with the way that Jesus is going about his ministry, the things that he's doing, they get offended when he's not doing the things that they would like him to be doing or expect him to be doing. And so the conflict over the Gospels, it builds and it builds and it builds and it builds until we get to this chapter or a couple chapters before. We just celebrated a couple weeks ago uh, Easter, Good Friday, the crucifixion. Um, this story takes place right before the crucifixion. And Jesus has just come into Jerusalem as king. He's cleared out the temple. So he just like forcibly removed people. And then he's just sitting there in the temple. And what we see is all of Jesus' enemies, they kind of start to gather together. They join forces. And even different kind of like groups of these people who didn't like Jesus, who would normally hate each other, they get together in order to trap him. And so we see these moments with Jesus where he's having these, these conflict stories, conflict stories. And his enemies are trying to question his authority. They're trying to trap him, 
politically, trying to ensnare him in his words. They're trying to discredit him theologically. And what we see is, is really interesting is there's this series, it, it looks the same way, where someone will come to Jesus and they'll ask him a question. And that question is trying to ensnare him or confuse him. Jesus will respond either with a question of his own or maybe a, a statement. And then they'll dialogue back and forth. And Jesus is just like knocking these guys down left and right, left and right. He's making them look silly, which was a big deal in this culture. Because they're all about how you looked in front of other people. So Jesus is making fools of them. And then what we have is this story. And it feels very similar from other stories, from the other, the other um, times where Jesus is interacting with these guys, right? But it's, but it's different. It's twisted. It's kind of flipped on its head. Because in this moment, it zooms in on a single scribe, not a group of people, but on one man. And I want us to even just kind of go back into this passage and get a, get a feel for what's happening. Now, this man is a religious leader. He is the kind of guy who has theological conversations for fun, right? Which may be some of you, but maybe not all of you. Um, he's the kind of guy who, when he walks in the room, people stop and they take notice. Because this is what he does for his whole life. His whole life is all about the law. And he runs with these guys, and he's probably been hearing about Jesus. Because Jesus' influence has grown. The city is the city's kind of a, a, alive, right, with, with who Jesus is. They're t- talking about him. So this man has heard about Jesus. And he's watching. He's observing Jesus interact with each of these people. And what happens in him is he starts to take pause. And he starts to see how Jesus is responding to these people. And then he comes with a question of his own. And he says, teacher, what's the greatest commandment of all? Now, this was a common question. So this isn't something he's just dropping out. This is something that they debated that was considered. So he's asking, he's asking a common question to which Jesus responds. And they have this dialogue back and forth. And then the scribe at the end, instead of responding to Jesus, either with pushback trying to ensnare Jesus himself, he looks at him and he he receives Jesus' teaching. To which Jesus replies, seeing seeing that he answered wisely, Jesus says, you're not far from the kingdom of God. So my question tonight is what is the difference? What's the difference between this one man and this other group of Pharisees and these enemies of Jesus? One of them received an invitation to be in the kingdom of God, and the others received harsh criticism from Jesus. So I want to submit to you tonight that the main difference is found in one, single, one simple word, and we're going to talk about it. And that's that the scribe came to Jesus with a heart of humility. A heart of humility. Now, uh, when I say that word humility, our culture kind of has its own idea of what humility is, right? I have this picture in my head like, um, are you guys like UFC fans? Are you guys like watching boxing? The one dude in the back. All right. Anyways, like, so there's this like this, this thing like, before the match, like there's, there's the two guys standing next to each other and it's all like big and hype, right? And like our picture of humility is like the one boxer who doesn't like trash talk the other boxer when he's like all mad in his face. And then in the ring, right, he shows up and just knocks the dude out. And everyone's like, yeah, he's so humble. He's so great, right? Our culture has this idea of humility. It's like, It's just like not being awesome until you can be so awesome that everyone knows that you're really, really great, right? That's not really what humility is in Scripture. I'm going to give you guys a definition that we're going to be working with, and then we'll talk about a little bit of how that plays itself out. Biblical humility is being in a low position. It's a status, a low position socially, politically, in heart, And then this is really important for us tonight. And it's a deep willingness to be wholeheartedly associated with those who are. It's being in a low state, and it's a deep willingness to be associated with those who are in a low state. Let me give you some examples here. Throughout Scripture, we see God interacting and utilizing and um, and, and using these people who are in low positions. Right? Let's say... Um, David to Saul. David was a king at some point, but he didn't start out as a king. He started out as a shepherd. And Saul was the king. And God, instead of choosing Saul, chose David, who was in a lowly estate. All throughout Scripture, we see this idea of humility being either someone who is lowly or someone who wholeheartedly embraces that low position. One of the best examples of this in the New Testament is Mary. Now, Mary, she's... A pregnant teenager, 
in her culture, she has no status. Zero, none. She would have been out, out, no status. But what we see in Luke chapter 1, I'm going to read you a little bit of a prayer that she prayed um, when the Holy Spirit came on her. Yeah, Luke chapter 1. And this is what she said. She said, my soul, it glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. And from now on, all generations will call me blessed. Jumping forward to verse 51, he says, or she says, he has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He's brought down rulers from their thrones, but he has lifted up the humble. He's filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. Humility in the Gospels and in the Bible is being in a low estate like Mary. It says that God saw the low estate of his servant. Probably the, the, the prime example of humility in scriptures is Jesus. Is Jesus himself, right? We're going to read another passage in Philippians 2. I'm just trying to paint a picture here for you that we're going to work with for the rest of the night. In Philippians chapter 2, Paul says this about Jesus. He says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. He goes on to say, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place, gave him the name that's above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We see Jesus, fully God, right? Of all of of the, the things in the entire creation, who could take a place of position and status Even by becoming a man, Jesus humbles himself. He comes into full solidarity with the low position of humanity. So it's this idea of laying down something that's been entrusted to you. We serve the God, okay, who raised up Abel and rejected Cain, his older brother. We serve a God who blessed Jacob, the patriarch, above his older brother Esau. He selected a nation of impoverished slaves to bear his name. We serve the God who selected David and rejected Saul, who chose to enter personally into human history as an infant and revealed that the highest place of human glory is actually a man who's crucified outside of the city naked on a cross. Humility is laying yourself down, biblically speaking. It's being willing to empty yourself. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to present that that's actually what the scribe did in that moment. Now, the scribe, like I mentioned, he had a crew. He had his people, right? He had um, the guys that he ran with. And in this moment, what he's doing is he's setting himself apart from those that he was affiliated with in order to become associated with Jesus and his crew. Why would he do that? Because he saw truth in Jesus. Because he saw life in Jesus. And so he laid himself down in order to experience Jesus for who he truly is. Now, this idea of humility, it's, it's big, it's bold in some ways, right? It's like, okay, great, it's associating with the lowly. Why is this important for me, you might be asking? Or how, how, would, I even, how would I even do this in my life, right? It's one thing to say, great, here's a message on humility, now Go be humble, right? It's like, it's this tricky thing. So what I want to do tonight is I want to offer you three different practices, rhythms that you can build into your life that help to cultivate humility. And then I want to even point out some of the fruit that those practices, I believe, will produce. I want to say for starters is that humility and the fruit of humility, it actually has ramifications for every part of your life. Um, All these parts that are important to you as young adults, things like career, relationships, looking more like Jesus, community, humility will fuel you in these spaces and they'll transform you. So here, here are some practices. The first practice, practice humility 
by embracing opportunities to give away your influence, power, and standing to embrace the things and the people that God loves. That's a mouthful. I'm going to read it again and give you a story to help you understand. Practice humility by embracing opportunities to give away your influence, power, and standing to embrace the things and the people that God loves. Okay, this was a handful of years ago for me. This was probably nine years ago at this point. I had just graduated high school. I had worked hard in high school, you guys. I had done yard work and saved, and I worked at a frozen yogurt store which I would not recommend, even if you like frozen yogurt, good gracious. And I'd gone and done this internship, and long story short, I find myself at school, and uh, I don't have a job. And I'm like, that's fine, right? I'm living on faith and love. And then one day, I, I, do, I do the move. I pull out my phone, and I'm like, I should probably check how much money is in my bank account. But, like, I really didn't want to. Can you guys relate with me? Where you're like... We should probably look. And I did, and I opened it up, and the number said $64. I had $64 in my bank account. Some of you guys are like, Josh, that's pretty good, right? You should see my bank account. (laughs) Anyways, for me, that was like, oh, boy, I got to get a job. (laughs) So I go out, and I find a job, and I had a friend who was working at a local homeless shelter, and he said, Josh, come come work for me. I'll pay you 12 bucks an hour, which was good. It was good money, making 12 bucks an hour. And so what I ended up doing is I was a... Um, I don't even know the, the, the title of the role, but I worked at a, an emergency women's shelter. So what we would do, we were in downtown Denver, and every night around 6 o'clock, we would open the doors up. Any woman could come in from the streets, um, have a safe place to be, a safe place to have a meal and a place to sleep for the night, and then they'd be sent back out in the morning. Um, and, y'all, I was, I was green. I did, not know, I did not know what was coming for me. Holy moly, you guys, like, these ladies were intense, intense, right? I'm walking through, and they're, like, cursing me out and kicking at me, and I'm like, what is happening over here? Um, but, but gradually, what I started to see, right, so I'm, I'm coming in. It's not really like I have status, but what I'm, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm seeing these people who culture says have no status. They have nothing to their names. No money, no family, no social structure. They are literally living on handouts, And what I started to experience as I sat with these women, I would sit with them, and I remember sitting across from a lady who, um, in her previous life, she was a successful school teacher, and she's starting to tell me her story. And it comes out that she'd made some pretty serious mistakes that had basically destroyed her reputation. She'd lost her job, she'd lost her family, and she's out on the streets. And I'm sitting across from her. I'm just listening to her life story. She's She's talking to me. The next night, I was sitting with a woman whose husband took her and threw her down the stairs. She broke her tailbone. And I'm just sitting, just weeping as this woman is telling me her story, getting to pray with this woman and see the power of God come and touch her and actually heal her body in that moment. What I what I realized, what I realized for me was that God was was so incredibly with these people. (laughs) That God had fully entered into their story. And because I was with them, I got to enter into God's story as well. So what I want to submit to you tonight is that if you take these opportunities to cross lines, cross boundaries, go to people who have no status, that in your life, humility will set you apart to participate in the work and in the ministry of God. Some of you guys are here. We're in this season of life where many of us are trying to figure out careers and callings, seeing what are we made to do. You're in school. Maybe you're working your first job. But I want to submit to you tonight, you guys, our culture tries to sell us this nonsense that all of your vocation and your career is about gain, 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 right? What are you good at? How can you be bigger, more? You guys, the kingdom of God is about giving. The kingdom of God, vocation in the kingdom of God, your career and calling, it's about taking yourself from wherever you are and going down as low as you possibly can. Because that's where God is, friends. Because our God is a humble God who associates himself with the lonely. Take opportunities to spend time to lay down your influence. Second practice, that's practice number one. Practice number two. We practice humility by embracing a lifestyle of radical honesty. Radical honesty. Now, uh, our culture has some weird thoughts about honesty. 
right? It's like we, we live in a world that's sort of bipolar when it comes to honesty. In the one sense, they say that you need to find who you truly are, right, and discover your identity and then just be honest about it. Live your truth, right? But they're unwilling to acknowledge the fact that that's exhausting. My goodness. Have you guys ever tried to make yourself and figure out who you are? Guys, it's, it's a little overwhelming. Tonight, I would submit to you that if we're actually genuinely honest, that genuinely and generally leads us to one of two places. If you're honest about your life, about who you are, about your abilities, your graces, it either leads you to despair or to trust. And that may sound funny, right? But if we're here and if we're trying to, if we're being honest about our ability to do our own lives, about our ability to discover who we are and live out this realized vision of ourselves, at some point, you're going to have to be honest about the fact that you can't do it on your own. So what I want to submit is that living a lifestyle of genuine honesty, it actually leads us to a place of trust in Jesus. And that the fruit of that, the fruit of practicing a lifestyle of radical honesty is an empowered, genuine life transformation. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about here. Uh, maybe even make it a little bit more applicable to you guys. I've had a way over the years of walking with uh, a number of, of young, young guys. Um, I've been able to lead groups and do, do a lot of different things, working with a lot of different young people. Um, there was this one young man who I had been building relationship with. We'd been spending time together for maybe two, three, four months. Um, and he kind of had this, like we would, we would talk and he'd be really nice, but then like we'd sit down and start having a meaningful conversation. I'd, I'm going to be asking him some, some questions about his life and he'd get really evasive. Um, and he would, he would kind of like... He would always change the subject. And so I'm just kind of noticing. I'm saying, okay, so something, just, just something's probably going on. Um, but, but Lord, thank you for this guy. And just was honestly just asking the Lord to open up an opportunity for him. Um, keep journeying with this young man for a handful more months. We are at this retreat center together. Um, and it's late one night. Like everybody else is asleep. And I'm sitting there. And he's sitting next to me. And we're just kind of talking. And, and he gets really silent and quiet, and I'm like, all right, here we go. If this is a moment, let's see. Um, and he starts to talk, and he starts to share, and he starts to tell me about his life and about his home, and he starts to tell me about things that he'd gotten wrapped up in and about choices that he'd made, and he starts to tell me about how some of the things that he had chosen to do had crossed some major lines with people in his life. And he started telling me about how some of these lines even got crossed into abuse with some people in his life and how he felt bound up deeply in these patterns that he'd gotten himself into, but that he desperately wanted to be out of them. That his heart screamed out for Jesus and for freedom, but he didn't know what to do. He was stuck. And it was an intense moment, right? It's like, whew. Come, Lord Jesus, right? Come, Lord Jesus. But you know what the beautiful thing about that young man's story is he shared with me, we had some really, really hard conversations after that, both with me and with other people. But he committed himself to a process of being completely honest about the things that were going on in his life, about the things that were pulling him and deforming him. And you guys, he got help and his life started to change. Before when he would, he'd be walking and I would, I'd say hi, he might like make brief eye contact and then look down. This dude, he starts walking around and he's making eye contact with me, right? He starts being joyful and hopeful. And he's actually, I think he's in school right now, literally to go into ministry. This guy is, is amazing. He's, he became honestly one of my best friends. Radical honesty. And this is not, here's not what I'm, what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that you need to just like, be an open book about all your stuff with everybody. That's not at all what I'm saying. But what I am saying is that if there are places in your life that you feel like revealing them to someone would bring you low, and so you haven't done it, you've been hesitant to humble yourself before God and before someone else, if you're carrying those things, you will not see life transformation unless God miraculously enters into that space, which he can. So what I want to submit to you, yeah, Jesus invites us into a life of freedom, full freedom, friends. 
Freedom where you can walk down, make eye contact with someone, and know your heart is clean. And I really believe we get there by being honest. And by being honest with people that we trust. By being honest with either pastors in this community, with friendships. Y'all, even I said before, I get to work by helping in section community, getting people connected. We need people because we need people to help us. We need people to be honest with. If you don't have someone tonight, please come and talk to someone. Come and talk to Eddie. Come and talk to me. We want to help you get connected. If you do have someone, then hear my challenge, friends. Be honest. Be honest. The third uh, and final practice that will kind of bring us home tonight. Practice humility by coming to Jesus on his own terms. I want to loop us back around to the scribe. The scribe was a part of this group of people, the Pharisees. You guys, these people were longing for God. They were longing for a Messiah. They were, all of their hope was set on, God, save us. Send a Savior, Lord. Help me to live out the law so that I cannot miss what you're doing and be a part of it. They were looking for Jesus, and they missed him when he was right in front of their face. They missed him because they refused to come to Jesus on his terms. Have you seen this? They were so wrapped up in their idea of what it would look like when God came that they missed him. But the scribes saw him. Why did the scribes see him? Because he was willing to see God for who he was, come to Jesus on his own terms. In this moment, in this story, right, the scribe, or Jesus looks at the scribe. He says, okay, great commandment. Love the Lord your God. The next one like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. The scribe receives it. And then Jesus looks at him and he says, says, Jesus looking at him saw that he answered wisely. Oh, man. Let's just pause on that for a moment. He saw that he answered wisely. In these moments as we're reading scripture, just picture what Jesus' expression was like. How do you see Jesus in your mind responding to this person? Man, I see Jesus full of love. I see him full of tender compassion for this man. He says, he saw that he answered wisely, and he said, you are not far from the kingdom of God. I want to submit to you tonight that the scribe wasn't close to the kingdom because he provided the right answer. It wasn't that he just echoed the right thing, and Jesus is like, that's the right answer. You're close to the kingdom of God. That's awesome. He was close to the kingdom of God because his heart was humble and open and willing to see and to receive Jesus for who he really is. The scribe was close to the kingdom, not because he had the right answer, but because he was willing to come to the king himself. You guys, this probably cost him. It probably cost this man. And especially if he became a follower of Jesus, he would have been ostracized from his community. He would have been ostracized from his position. He would have lost power, significance, and importance. So even for us tonight, as we're kind of coming here to the end, I want to, I want to give us a couple different invitations. What's the invitation of Jesus to us as we're in this moment? It's simple, is embrace humility. As we're talking, I hope that you're identifying and even feeling some different portions of, <laughs> of what I'm talking resonating with you, right? That first practice, practice humility by embracing opportunities to give away your influence, power, and standing to embrace the things and the people that God loves. Who do you not like? Who do you wish you couldn't spend time with? Who do you avoid intentionally? Maybe are they even in this room? You guys, God calls us to live lifestyles where we lay down and go low. I believe that some of you in this room, even to tie this in vocationally, I believe that some of you in this room are, are wrestling vocationally because there's been a struggle and an unwillingness to go low. Tonight, I want to invite you to go low. Invite God into that space. The second invitation, practice humility by living a life of radical honesty. If you're carrying something tonight, you need to find someone you trust. You need to lay yourself down and get free of it because God wants to set you free. He wants to transform your life. 
He wants to empower genuine life transformation. So that's an invitation. And then this last invitation, come to Jesus on his own terms. Y'all, I know we're all here in different places. I'd imagine you're, you're at least here in this room because you thought Jesus was interesting or maybe somebody just invited you. That's great. Um, maybe you've been going to church for a really, really long time, um, but you uh, maybe have not made <laughs> Jesus actually the king of your life. Because when we come to Jesus on his own terms, Jesus is going to be himself, and that's it. Jesus is a king. Jesus is a Lord. Jesus is God. He's creator, right? He loves you tenderly, and he gave everything to be with you. But man, he wants to be the king of your life. And so if you're here tonight, and if you haven't put your faith and your trust in Jesus, man, I want to invite you into that. You guys, Jesus is life. You will not find life apart from him. But in him, oh my goodness, you guys, he changes everything. And then as a sub-point in that, if you're in this, in this kind of space, and if you've, been, if you've been really like going to church and doing the church thing for a long time, but if you feel disconnected from, from Jesus as a friend, I think there's an invitation for us here as well. I think there's an invitation for us to come back to Jesus on his own terms because he also wants all of us. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna go back into a space of worship I'd invite you guys to stand um, as we're doing that. And I'd invite us to ask the Holy Spirit what he wants to do. Three invitations, really simple. Go to the outcast, be honest with your process, come to Jesus on his own terms. Just say, Holy Spirit, where, where am I in that? And then let him talk to you because he's really good and he's really kind and he will. He's the one who's going to do the work. It's like Pastor Eddie said. We can't muscle ourselves into sanctification. So ask him, listen, respond. After worship, I'm gonna come up and we'll pray together and ask God to do his work in us. Let me pray for us right now as we're transitioning into worship. We say, oh, come Holy Spirit. We say, come Holy Spirit, do your work in us. Come Holy Spirit. I pray God that you would reveal to us what you wanna do. And thank you that you're kind. Lord, in Romans, I believe it says, it says that your kindness is what leads us to repentance. And so, God, I invite you to come. We invite you to come and in your kindness to show us where you want us to respond. God, if it's to an outcast or if it's to lay down our authority, our authority or our status, would you give us a face or a name of someone you want us to reach out to? Lord, if it's to engage in radical honesty, would you just tell us what you want us to say? Put your finger on it. And Lord, if it's to come to you on your own terms, would you reveal to us where we've missed you? And just tell us what you're like in that space. So we love you, Jesus. We welcome you. Amen. stars they wept the morning sun was dead the savior of the world was fallen his body on the cross his blood poured out for us the weight of every curse upon him Bye. 
poured out your mercy for us sinners. So we sing hallelujah, we sing hallelujah, we sing hallelujah, the Lamb is overcome, we sing hallelujah, we sing hallelujah, we sing hallelujah, the Lamb is overcome, we sing hallelujah, sing it out for everything he's done in your life, for all the ways he showed up. Jesus. Jesus, we say you are alive and lifted high. God, we love you. We love you, Jesus. And we do. We lift you up, God. We lift you up, God. And Lord, we echo the words of Philippians chapter 2. Lord, thank you that because you made yourself a servant by becoming obedient and pouring yourself out and going low, obedient to death, even the death of the cross. Lord, now, now, God, you have the name that's above every other name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that you are God. And so we give you glory and honor and praise in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. What a joy, friends. Thank you for letting me share this space with you. I would encourage you, listen to the Holy Spirit. If he was putting something on your heart, respond, act. Don't let it lie. Thank you for letting me come. Love you guys. We'd love to meet you guys. Pastor Eddie. Awesome. Thanks, Josh. I don't have anything to add. I just wanted to jump up here and remind you, if you are interested in serving guys on April 29th, please make sure you're signing up with that QR code. And we will see you guys next Tuesday night, 7 o'clock right here. I'll see you then.